uh, in this time. Thank you very much for everyone who's given the time. I know it's a, it is a Friday afternoon, so appreciate that. Um, we'll be taking you through a bit of an introduction to ourselves. We are quick release. Uh, there are a few of us on the call um, today. So a few bits and pieces I'll run through as a content and agenda. We'll have a few different people speaking from a, a couple of different perspectives on, on things that we do and then how we do it. Um, so just to kick off, an introduction to Quick Release and ourselves. So founded in 2003, uh, as a company, we recognize that there is increasing product complexity uh, in the global manufacturing strategies. And this unprecedented growth has led to our definition of a PDM professional, um, and PDM as, as a career. In recent years, we've married our deep knowledge of PDM alongside you know, a more advisory uh, consultancy service dedicated to optimizing uh, data control within complex manufacturing environments. We look to release the full value of an organization's people, their systems, and their processes. And really what we're trying to do is to enable our clients to build better products faster and cheaper. So a little bit of the content of what we're gonna be looking at today. Uh, so we'll have a bit of a company overview of a look at what do we do and how do we do it. Uh, a look at our engineering services, um, side of the work and opportunities there. How you would go about joining Quick Release and, and why, why should you join or why would you join uh, the company? So just a bit of context, who am I? Um, so I said, my name is Daniel Melrose. I joined Quick Release in June, 2017. Um, I'm a projects and people manager, as well as the lead for recruitment and resourcing here in Australia. In terms of project delivery, I've been lucky enough to work on a number of different things, prototype management uh, for the Ford European combustion engines. I was an engineering change controller for the plug-in electric hybrid commercial vehicles, as well as the base program lead vehicles. I worked within our centralized engineering services team, um, providing services to the, the, the design engineers for body interior as the seats and overhead integration lead, um, and currently working within the electrical team as a cost reduction project lead. A little bit of background about me. Um, I studied in the university in the UK. Uh, I finished a master's at the University of Bath in innovation and technology. Um, I am also a cat Filipino rugby player, uh, just to chuck that in there for you. So what are we going to be looking at? So the team, uh, who are we? Where are we? Uh, so as a company, we have a strong global presence with offices um, scattered around the world. Probably most relevant for us today, we have three locations within Australia. Um, the central hub of our work and the, a lot of our PDM population lives here in Melbourne, Victoria. We do have a number of sites in the UK, in Europe, as well as two sites in America, um, on the East Coast and on the West Coast. As a company, you know, we are, as of 2021, um, 250 plus people and growing continually. We have three new starters beginning with us on Monday, which we're all really excited for. What is it that we do in essence? What, what is PDM? What does that mean? Um, so just to frame the context of what we're going to be going through today, things I want you to take away from this is the sort of the core values of the tenants that support everything that we do day to day. We call them before QRs, uh, just to mention through our branding. So quality releasing, quality relationships, like response and curiosity quality, delivering quality in everything we do. You know, we're smart people who are engaged to do the best job that we can do. It's a central focus for us to deliver that across everything. That quality relationships, we understand that systems and data isn't going to solve all of these issues and these complexity challenges. It's that interfacing between systems, data, and people where we live. Quick response, you know, giving that sense of strong support that we are here in partnerships with our clients. We understand their priorities and their urgencies and we react to that. Apologies. Um, and curiosity, doing things that we enjoy doing, challenging ourselves. Can we do this better? Why are we doing it this way? So with that, why is it that we do what we do? As mentioned, complexity has increased tenfold across the manufacturing worlds. Engineers as a profession are struggling with the amount of data management and complexity they've got to do. 
you know, a real premise for us starting as a company was that engineers were spending as little as 25% of their time actually designing parts. You know, the systems have not fixed this gap. You know, building more systems and more processes doesn't improve efficiency <laughs> by any means. Um, and we realized that all of these things together defined us as a professional group, um, as BDM analysts. So what type of things, where do we impact this work? You know, what we do under the bonnet as such, essentially everything. You know, there are a number of areas that we support our clients um, across areas. A big focus is in automotive and in OEMs. We do this across a number of different manufacturing environments, through a range of different things. We understand people and processes and systems work together. There is no silver bullet solution. This is all iterative, the way that we can improve what we're doing. You know, the progressive maturity has changed. It's not about meeting deadlines anymore. It's about building good products. Um, Hadar will take you through a little bit about change management um, in a little bit, uh, actually next. So I'm going to hand it over to him. Hey guys, good afternoon. Um, my name is Hadar. Um, and my official job title with Quick, Re Quick Release is a qualified project analyst. So I've been working with our, our client Ford since January 2021, and I graduated from the University of Melbourne um, end of last year uh, with a master's mech engineering. Um, so I actually did my, my capstone with MUR um, doing aerodynamics and suspension integration, uh, just to give you a, a little over overview in what I did at uni. Um, and so quick fun fact, if I were to get any Ford car for free, it would be the 2016 Focus RS. So uh, the more cultured of you will know that's the one with the drift mode. And I think that choice speaks for itself. Um, so I just want to open this up to, uh, to talk about what you guys are doing at uni and, and how change management fits within your capstones. Um, so if, if I could get a couple of volunteers um, to talk about how they process changes from, from when, it's, when it's first ideated to actually ac executing a change within their, their capstone or their university project. Um, would anyone like to kick us off? Uh, yeah, hey now, I'll jump in if you would like. Um, so I'm part of Aries, where the Union Love is a rocket club, um, and we uh, we're fairly new, but we're, we're working on these sort of processes at the moment. Um, so we're, we're a our aim is to design and build a rocket that will reach exactly ten thousand feet um, and come back down and land, and as one piece, obviously. So. Uh, the, the sort of the process that we're starting to put, put together now is we, we have an initial stage before PDR, our, our design review, where we, we have a lot of ideas and we, we, we get a whole lot of like how can we achieve this goal and then we, we come together and have a preliminary, where we're planning to have a preliminary re review where we <clears throat> go over all the, all, the, all the ideas that we have and have, have like nailed down a sort of general sort of this is what our rocket, this is, these are the subsystems, this is everything that will fit into our rocket. Then we go after that, we have a, another period of time where we, we investigate like how exactly we're planning to do every single part of, of that. So we're, we're, we, we work out the math behind our fins, we work out what, what the correct nose cone sort of shape is. We, we nail down everything and then we have a CDR, which is like our final part, and we, like, that, that's where we finish up everything and then we go into manufacture. Um, so just, just looking at that entire process as a whole, that's kind of the, the concept, the concept to design kind of process, but what happens if something occurs in between to cause you to deviate from your path? How do you react to an emergency situation and do you have a process to manage that? Yeah. So, uh, that's, that's just happened recently. So our, our motor supplier, um, turned out that they didn't actually, uh, let us buy a rocket that we paid for a year ago, like the motor that we paid for a year ago. So we've, we've had to take this back and, and, and redesign our, our rocket for a lower power motor. So um, we, yeah, we're, sort of, we're still working through it at the moment, but our plan is to, to have a sort, sort of mini PDR where we just we, we put whatever we have into our, whatever we had designed, put that into this different type of design. And then we're going to plan to have a CDR as well, which will hopefully allow us to, to continue but yeah it, it is definitely a, a process that we are still perfecting 
Sounds good. Thank you for going over that with us. Uh, is there anyone else that is doing a similar kind of product project that wants to give us an overview? Uh, no, Sean, I'm going to pick on you as our current host. <laughs> That's fine. Um, I'll jump in and I was actually just about to say that like, I probably, in terms of projects at the moment, I don't think I've, I've developed any sort of change management process. I've just joined, jumped on board with MUI, so I'm not sure if they have any change management because we're in the beginning stages. I wouldn't say I do have one, but just thinking back to sort of some of the projects I've done throughout my university course and any of the outside of that, um, I think it's been a very ad hoc change management process. If, if a problem occurs, um, kind of just come up with a decision and, and it's, it's often not the best result. So I feel like having a change management strategy would be would be much more useful but um i don't think uh, i don't think i've ever had one before yep Fair enough. thank you um anybody else got anything to share before i move on no all good uh next slide please dan so yeah the reason i asked that question is really to just outline the whole approach that we look at from engineering having gone through mur at melbourne uni I know that this is all up in the air. There is no such thing as a change management process at uni, and I wasn't taught anything about this. And you know, in in real life, this can't happen. It's it's not it's not a system that works for a company as big as Ford. Um, and we we cover a lot of things at uni, such as timeline and deliverables that we need to look at in an engineering cycle. But change management is a huge gap that's missing, and this has to be developed by by companies such as Ford from scratch for their own purposes. Um, so here at Quick Release, we're trained in, in managing these processes um, and, and that's, that information is passed down by Quick Release employees globally um, as well as Ford employees and, and it's shared around and retained within the company. Um, and, and it's not just Ford that have to handle a change management process like this. That's the example I'm using here. But, you know, there's plenty of other companies that we work with worldwide, such as McLaren, that will have their own bespoke change management processes. Um, and <clears throat> the key point here is that engineers need their time to engineer um, and it's unrealistic to expect them all to be experts of this process and, and that's where we step in and we really own the change management process and, and help them through it. Um, we're, it's, a, it's a constantly developing system um, on top of that. So we sort of act as consultants um, and, and in our point of view, we look at the process and we look at each step and say, is this the best way to be doing it? And we leverage our experience of other change management processes around the world uh, in order to optimize our clients' processes. Um, and and I, I think the key point of all this is that it, it all comes back down to the chief program engineer for anything that we're doing. Um, the approval has to be there and it has to be an official um, signed approval from someone to allow something to change, whether that's an idea or it's a bill of material change or a final actual design change. Um, this is the process. Back to you, Dan. Thanks, Adar. Uh, thanks very much for that. So <clears throat> to try and give some context to this, right, there's some numbers in there which is like, wow, really? Like that long? Are they that expensive to do this? You know, and you have to understand the scale of it. I've mentioned a lot about, oh, it's a complex environment. The complexity is growing. It's unprecedented. But damn, what do you mean by that complexity? So let's have a look at what do we understand as complexity and how we can frame that context for you. Um, so <laughs> complexity, a problem of spoiled for choice, essentially, is what we're looking at here. So let's think of a theoretical company, you know, where maybe you guys know it a little bit, you know, with some choices that you have to make. Uh, let's talk about a sandwich. Uh, so my company, I'm going to call them Wireboost, just to like, talk for any, uh, any, any commercial problems I'm going to have. So I'm building a sandwich, essentially. I have one sandwich that I'm trying to build. That's the top level, or we call it top level assembly. Uh, kudos for points on that. Okay, in the sandwich, I've got four different types of bread. Do I want a malted rye? Do I want an Italian loaf? You know, so it represents this way. Four different versions of the sandwich you can have. But okay, but what I want different proteins, you know, or vegetarian um, swaps for. So we have six meats. You can choose up to two per sandwich. So you're opening up your complexity, the number of different options multiplied by each other. We now have 60 different types of compositions of sandwich that we can go into. Imagine, okay, I want some vegetables as well. Um, up to choice of two, six, 1,700 different sandwiches as a set, as possible combinations. Well, so I said, okay, I need some sauce on that. I'm a sauce man. Um, 
7,000 different combinations of sandwiches. And this is very simplistic as a review against this. Now, if you were to stack all of these sandwiches on top of each other, you could build two and a half merge khalifas. Think about this in the context of commerce and the optionality that you're able to pick in the products that you're buying as the consumer. How do we build processes and data management systems that will support this? So what does this sort of look like in the automotive world as complexity? So let's have a look at the Ford Focus, the number of different colors and standards and materials that you can have. How do you represent this? So this is the internal cockpit for these. Each of these different aspects will represent themselves as optionality or complexity that our clients have to manage. How do we describe this complexity? You can do it in text, you know, against the requirements of the vehicles and the specifications. Or, you know, how do you represent this in a logical stream? You can break it down into logic gates. A plus B equals C version. You can't build A and C together, you know, type of context to it. So how do you visualize this or how do you understand this very simple question of how many parts are in a car seat bill of material, you know, which is the, the makeup of what that product is. Is it one, is it two, five, 20, 50, 100? Really, it depends on who you're asking. Who's asking? It's a different point of view to it. If you're the engineering team within the car manufacturer, you would say that there are five parts within a seat. There are five different components that make that up that you have to be design responsible for. Or if you're the supplier who's bringing that seat in, you might view the seat as having 50 parts because you have to manage the internal design against those contexts. Now, if we're looking at it from a manufacturing perspective, the automotive manufacturing, it's only one. The seat comes entirely ready to the plant. The tier one manufacturing, they have to put together all the subcomponents to it. So it can be up to a hundred different parts within that set. So depending on who you're asking, there are X number of seats in the X number of parts of the seat in the car. Cool. Ah. <laughs> it's, uh, how, how do we manage this? And that's where we come in. You know, what, what value do we bring is we understand this and we can translate what an engineer wants to have from their design into the real world impact of what you get at the end. So that was our PDM content. I'm gonna hand over to Vincent, who's gonna to talk to us about engineering services. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so as uh, we were able to, to introduce um, in, in the beginning of the presentation, today in Australia, we have two services um, we are looking after in quick release. The first one is the PDM side of things uh, that Dan and Ada was, were able to, to present. And the second one is the engineering services. Before starting uh, to go into detail about that, let me introduce myself. If you go to the next slide, Dan. So I'm uh, Vincent. I'm uh, the business leader for engineering services uh, for Cura Australia. I've been working for Quick Release now for the past year, since August last year. And prior to that, I was working for the parent company of Quick Release, uh, which is called Alten. I'm going to tell you a bit more about that because uh, everything is really linked on engineering services. In terms of education, so I'm, as you can hear, I'm from France. I did my education um, as a, an engineer over there in uh, ECAM Toulouse. I graduated in 2015. Uh, and fun fact, I've only arrived uh, last month uh, in Australia. Prior to that, I have been able to live through three lockdowns, two in UK, one in France, and I'm lucky to have my fourth one here in Australia. So I think I'm uh, as complex as the PDM things, uh, I've been able to open that. Last topic, uh, the picture on the right, it's not me enjoying uh, taking my picture next to garbage. It was part of a QSI initiative uh, with the Alten team in UK, where we were actually cleaning the beach. I thought it was a good opportunity to share also some of the initiatives the company takes. Thanks, Dan. If you go to the next one, you can go to the next slide, please. Thanks. So to talk about engineering services, let me first introduce you to our current company. So uh, Quick Release uh, was acquired a couple of years ago uh, by a company called Alten. So Alten is a worldwide engineering company supporting customers across various sectors around engineering services. 
Alten is mainly, uh, he is a worldwide leader around this activity. And as Alten didn't have any local uh, footprint in Australia, uh, when um, QR joined the Alten family, we decided to support the development of not only the QR offer, but also the Alten offer in Australia uh, under the same name, Quick Reels. So we have started to work uh, around that in Australia uh, last year and now growing, uh, growing the team. So let me tell you a bit more about Alten and what is engineering services. So if you go to the next slide. So Alten, as I was mentioning, it's a worldwide engineering services. It's a company that was funded 30 years ago uh, in France, now represented in more than 30 different countries in the world. Uh, as you can see, quite uh, an important uh, number of employees, of engineers, I would say, uh, working in, um, in, in the world uh, for different customers, more than 4,000 customers today, with a constant growth and constant development of the activities uh, since uh, Alton was funded. I think the only uh, year that wasn't a year for, of growth for the company was uh, the first uh, couple of years of, of the company, but that's it. If I go a bit more in detail regarding the company, time if you jump to the next slide, thank you. So if I go a bit more about the detail, as um, I was mentioning, we are a worldwide uh, supplier for engineering services and uh, Alten is supporting various different industries. We split this industry around five main sectors that like you can see here, aerospace, defense, security, automotive, rail, naval, energy, life science, IT services and finance, telecoms and multimedia. And we are trying as much as possible to keep a balance between these five sectors, just to not be dependent uh, for, 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 from one uh, sector or another. I can give you a few examples of uh, crisis we had over the past years. It can be in the oil and gas, can be in the automotive sector, or aerospace. The fact that we were actually also working on other sectors um, helped Alten to continue growing. And you can see also uh, here uh, a few names of the main uh, customer of Alten. Uh, I will uh, give you a focus on what's happening here in, in Australia. So what do we do about engineering? So what is engineering services? Basically, engineering services, it's supporting our customers uh, on their different activities. Then if you go to the next one, sorry. So basically what is engineering services, it's supporting our customers around their different projects. How are we going to do that? Three solutions. The first one is to have some of our individual engineers joining directly uh, the customer team to be an additional support to their team. Second solution is when a customer has multiple projects going at the same time to have actually a team of engineers who can be adaptable to what the customer need on site with the customer to support uh, their different activities. Or we can also be involved on uh, what we call work package. So instead of requesting for some uh, resources or for, 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 for some skills, the customer is going to actually ask us or food design, or to take responsibility of a specific project. In Australia, we are at uh, the early stage uh, of the development of, um, of the engineering services. Uh, so today, in total, Quick Release Australia, it's 30 consultants, only five on the engineering aspect today, but we are looking to, to grow and to, to develop our, our capacities and capabilities in the next, um, in the next year and so on. Today, we have mainly two large customers we are working with, uh, Alstom and Ford, uh, across Melbourne and Brisbane for my team, mainly supporting activities around system engineering and testing, mechanical and electrical engineering, especially on design activities. Some activities also to come around software engineering and, and project management. I will give you just two examples uh, after this slide to, to explain a bit more what kind of support we can provide. That's what we do today. Um, if you stand up, yeah, thanks. That's what we do today, and we have quite a high expectation uh, in terms of growth uh, over the next year. Uh, to give you an idea, for 2022, we have already some um, expectation of uh, development in Adelaide and Perth to support other customers and other industries. We are looking also to extend our activities around uh, various sectors. So today, as I was mentioning, automotive, rail, 
tomorrow will be also sports in the aerospace and defense, uh, defense including the naval industry, with uh, quite a lot of different skills and expertise we want to develop in the company. Uh, you can see some, some examples uh, below. Uh, I'd be happy to answer uh, more in detail about that. About the project that we perform uh, today, I have so two examples I wanted to share with you today. If we jump to the next slide, then. So the first one was a project that we've been able to support our customer in the rail industry uh, during the past year um, uh, around what we call cost on track. Basically, we had one of our engineers who was uh, in charge of supporting uh, the customer to find areas of improvement, areas of savings uh, on their ongoing project, the project that uh, were getting developed. So to do that, uh, the engineer was directly interfacing with the manufacturing team, with um, the engineering team, but also uh, with uh, the central engineering uh, team in Europe from our customer to be able to identify all the small initiatives uh, and all the small savings that were um, able to be deployed on the project, on the existing project, but also for future projects in order to, for our customer to be always more competitive in terms of price always uh, more efficient uh, in terms of um, in terms of uh, material management and so on so we, our engineer was getting these ideas developing the ideas and then presenting uh, the opportunities of savings to the global board uh, and to the global um, custom track team that's the name of the team in charge of the savings for them uh, so he was based in, um, in melbourne supporting that um, across different programs uh, for our customer. So that's an example of some engineering project on uh, cost reduction. Another example of project is a more technical one, more related to system engineering uh, activities. So today we have uh, one of our engineers who is in charge of um, all the delivery of um, the um, brake system for new trains that are um, getting commissioned in, um, in Australia. Basically, his responsibilities will be first uh, an understanding of what are the requirements from the legal, the legal authority uh, to be able to validate uh, the use of a brake system in a train. So how to make sure that the train and the system is compliant to, to, to the norms and how to help uh, the customer and the team on providing the right proof to the authority uh, and to the final customer that the systems and the train were compatible to their expectation. So a lot of work around system engineering. Uh, I know you must have seen that uh, over your courses, over your project. System engineering is uh, the key aspect uh, of, uh, on product development. So he was really focused on all the validation verification part of the system, defining the test plan uh, and defining the verification plan to make sure that the train and the brake system was um, in line with the expectation. So that's a project that, that is still ongoing uh, with a quite interesting um, feedback from the customer today and with an activity that's going to grow uh, across different, um, different programs uh, in the coming, uh, coming month. If you jump to the next slide, then. So let's give you an idea of um, what we are doing currently uh, in Australia. As I was mentioning, we have a high expectation to grow the team uh, for engineering services in Australia, to be able to give the opportunity uh, to uh, new engineers to join us and to help uh, um, the development of the company uh, in the country, but also the development of the company as a group, so quick release and also the parent company, um, Alpen. And I want to give you a quick overview about how do we evolve as engineers? How do our engineers um, grow uh, in the company and take responsibilities? So today in uh, quick release in the engineering service team, we can identify three clear uh, development paths. 
One uh, is all uh, the support team, recruitment, communication, and so on, that will be new position uh, that we will open in the coming years to support the growth of the company. One is the business path, so to work uh, more on activities similar as mine on uh, the recruitment of the team, management of the project, interface with the customers, and so on. And uh, then the technical path, which is the core consulting activities, where you can involve either as project manager, so leading team in terms of the delivery of the work they are working on, uh, interfacing with, with um, business management uh, to also manage the delivery of the projects, uh, being able to interface with the customer to understand the technical challenges and so on. And the specialist path where you can involve as an expert in, involved not only uh, locally, but also involved on some of our worldwide projects at a group level. So that's a quick overview about engineering services. Obviously, in, a, in 10 minutes, it's difficult to, to, to show you everything that we do and everything we are able to, to achieve. But um, really, the main message um, behind this presentation was to be able to share with you a bit our plan, understand a bit what we do and, and our expectation for, for the future. More than happy to answer any question at the end of, 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 the, of the presentation. Uh, but I will hand it over to Dan for now. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much, Vincent. Um, and I will do a double hand on this one. I'll hand it over to Jess uh, for this one. So around, how do I join uh, the company? Thanks, Jess. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jessica, I just go to the next slide Stan, I think, um, and I'm the recruitment officer, um, I reside over both engineering services and product data management, um, I have worked at Quickly since 2019, taking a quick maternity break in that period, um, which brings me to um, being a proud mum, which is definitely another full-time role. And uh, I have a Bachelor of Human Resources Management as well. If you want to go to your next slide. So what do we look for in both um, engineering services? So in engineering services, we look for engineers at the graduate level, mainly to about 15 years experience in areas like mechanical, electrical, system software, automotive, and all those related fields. Of course, some might fall out of that. Um, and for product data management, we look for enthusiastic, most of the time, enthusiastic graduates in info systems or a related technical background, for example, anyone that does engineering or has a passion for data and um, analysis. We look for dynamic people. We look for willingness to uphold our four pillars, which Dan explained before, and um, someone who demonstrates passion in the sectors that we work in as well. Uh, can we go further to the next slide, Dan? So what does the recruitment process look like with us? Uh, next slide. Um, oh. No, please. <laughs> my heart fell for a second there. Um, so how do I combine a, a definition for what our company does on engineering and both PDM? So uh, Quick Release or Alton Group, we're under Quick Release, by the way, don't get um, confused with that. Um, implement teams of engineers or product data managers to uh, in our specialized sectors to improve project outcomes. We own, maintain, and or modify existing or new projects, adding value, inputs, and data to the organizations that help our clients achieve their overall goals. I know that that's very broad, but that's what we do. Um, so what do our, uh, what does our processes look like? Um, so first of all, for the engineering services, you basically put in an application or expression, expression of interest, um, for, uh, either roles that we have now or any upcoming roles that you'd like to hear about that maybe we're interested in, um, we'd be interested in your background, uh, and then down the road, we could, um, find a place for you, uh, just as long as you begin that 
that kind of um, process from beforehand. Um, and then, of course, if we do have an upcoming or foreseeable role right now in our hands that we can place you in, we will then conduct a first interview. We'll do that anyway. Um, and then process you to the second interview round. Um, so each interview stage focuses on um, some sort of level of your technical or um, uh, technical background, um, me being what you did and um, it, Vincent normally answering the question of how you did it. And then it'll go down to um, having a final interview with our business leaders and then an offer after that. Now, for our product data management side, it's a little bit of a different story because, as I said, most of the time we do hire um, a lot of graduates um, that come through this process. So when the application comes through, it will be assessed. The successful application will receive a data test. Um, when you do the data test, uh, which is an Excel um, um, uh, compatibility, um, you'll have to receive a 65% pass, um, pass rate, you'll go to a phone interview, you'll be then invited to an assessment centre if, if everything um, up until that point is good. And then if you go well in the assessment centre, you'll receive a final interview uh, with the project leader or a business student manager, and then, um, and then you'll get an offer after that. Um, so you might be thinking, why is it such a long process? Well, we'll go to the next slide. Um, so why do we recruit in this way? Okay, so to recruit, in, it, the, the first one is specialised to engineering services. It's to provide up quite, uh, upfront and quick uh, solutions to our clients and customer base. Um, and also, when people jump onto our team, we open all these doors to you guys. So we need to make sure that you guys are ready to um, take on those roles. We give you guys a lot of um, opportunities to own your work and be independent. And so knowing all those capabilities of your personality, um, your technical skills, your interpersonal skills beforehand is really important. And of course, our most important um, pillar, which is um, culture and being a crucial part of our team. Um, it is essential um, that we, we do this process to make sure that we explore every side of you um, and, uh, and get to know how you work and how you would look in, in our company as well. So that's why we do what we do. Thank you so much for listening uh, to my presentation, guys. And if you um, are interested in any roles, the website is um, down below there. And uh, my email, which I've gotten wrong, this is supposed to be a .au at the end, but um, we'll, we'll <laughs> work on that later. <laughs> on to, on to uh, you, Dan. Thanks, Jess. I will be sharing... Um all of the contact information from those attending today with Sean after the meeting. And Sean, if you want to disseminate that after, that would be great. Uh, thanks so much, Jess. Uh, okay, um, I'm gonna blast through this section because I did want to protect, you know, 10 or 15 minutes of time for questions and discussions at the end, but I don't want to skip this, <laughs> it's quite important. So, you know, we've talked a little bit about what type of things we do, the mindset around how we approach things, both from a PDM and engineering services side, how you might be able to join. Appreciate it, it was very, quick overview, you know, there's a lot of detail behind it. We're very happy to have detailed discussions with you all afterwards. But why would you join the company? Hopefully, you know, the aspects of cultural fit and the teamwork integration has been apparent to you throughout the presentation. I just want to highlight and overview some of that content with you. Um, so as just mentioned, opportunities and exposure galore at quick release. Um, by no means is this easy, I would say. Uh, the learning curve is very steep when you come to join the company. The expectations of us from our client are ever extremely high. You know, we are seen as specialists and as experts within that. Don't get me wrong, you will have oodles of support, your own mentor, your specified manager, a specified project manager. There is enough around there, but the expectation of the quality you bring is high as well. Um, alongside that, though, within Quick Release, progression in the PDM stream is based on delivery, not time in role. 
and it's something very key for, for you all to be aware of. We have varying levels of progression up until the manager level. We have consistent cycles where you can apply to that. Applications are open to all at each level. If you can showcase your quality and your delivery to our expectations, that's open to you. The quickest you go through the company levels is up to your own ambition and, and capability, essentially. Um, as Jens touched upon, senior exposure within projects. You will be exposed to some very senior level stakeholders very early on in your career. Um, for example, some work that I was doing in my first project in Engine had me in a weekly review with the Engine Chief Engineer to present data to them <laughs> to identify problems and issue statements. This is the type of work that we do. You know, what is the problem? How are we going to get through this? What is the data sanctity around what you're saying? Um, you also have the ability to define your own path within quick release. Personal development is owned by our analysts. Our managers are here to support you and to guide you. You define your own path against what you're motivated to do. The best workers are those who are happiest in what they're doing. Now you can do this within, obviously, this side of it, university relations, recruitment support. We're talking about project management, BD and accounts. Um, we're also talking about leading internal cultural functions as well. There's a lot of, lot of opportunities for you to showcase and work to areas that you want to. And just leading on from that, the ability to lead internal work streams. Part of the benefit of working for us as an advisory company is that we are essentially dual wielding. You work for the clients, you deliver to their expectations within our framework. You also work for us, sorry, other way around. You work for us and you work for the clients. So the internal aspects of, you know, are we getting together enough? Is well-being being considered within the company? Do we have the right cultural aspects? You know, are we reviewing our project ma management methodology properly? All of that stuff is available to you. For example, seventh month I was in the company, I identified that we didn't have a corporate social responsibility program. So I started, found that, and led that within the first year. Obviously, with the support and structures of you know the management team and the leaders that I had. But the autonomy to go and run at things that I was passionate about was something I was really happy to have had the opportunity to do, obviously alongside my project work. Um, what is it like at Quick Release and how do we make sure that we're, you know, we're doing the right things and we're thinking about what we're doing? Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about equality, diversity, and inclusion, which is a real central focus for us uh, as a company in the last you know, two or three years, we've really upped our game on this one. So just a little bit about it. So just to pick out some of my diversity here, um, we're just over 30 analysts in the PDM side for Australia. We have more than 15 different nationalities represented. That diversity of thought and cultural background is a huge aspect of how we add value to the projects that we do. Um, whilst I am talking to technically minded mechanical engineers in this call, you know, we hire degree agnostic um, across, you know, having that diversity. What we're really looking for, as Jess had mentioned, is logical perspective to problem solving, a coachability, you know, a willingness to learn and to challenge yourself, yeah, and the cultural fit. You know, it, teamwork is such a big part of what we do. We can't bring people on who don't fit that framework. Um, sorry, so to come back to it, we, we do have a dedicated equality, diversity, and inclusion function led at a global scale from the company. Um, we also have a number of international opportunities, COVID willing, <laughs> bearing in mind, but both Pat, obviously Vince has come over from, um, from our 10 group in the UK. Uh, both Patrick and I, um, Patrick's our business unit leader. He's on the call for any questions at the end. Hey, Pat. Um, we both used to work in the UK offices. I actually moved to Australia October, 2019. It's been a weird year and a half here. Uh, but, you know, that opportunity is open to you, both at a secondment level and as a permanent relocation, um, as you want. I just want to highlight as well, really unfortunately, we weren't able to get either Claudia or, or Dev um, into the presentation today. Um, but, you know, how we promote and how we focus on our, our women in STEM engagement. Um, Dev May um, is a second generation Sri Lankan Australian. She works with us. She's the EDI global lead for the company. Uh, which she took on within her first year and a half at uh, Quick Release. She's doing some fantastic work for us there. Um, as well as Claudia Vicenzo, our, our representative, proud Mexican and tequila expert, uh, who is a dual manager for Australia and for the US. Um, really hoping to have her back here soon. 
A big part of this is the cultural aspect, and I can stand here and wax and sit and play with me. It's like wax lyrical all day about, oh, it's a great place, but I'd rather give you some of the quotes from my analysts and from the team that we've got in at the minute. I asked these people to give me a one-liner yesterday. I got these back within two minutes, just for some context of some of the words and how our artists feel about working with us. Fernando is a uh, warm and fuzzies uh, for the quotes there. That is the end of our presentation for today. Um, as I said, I will be sharing. I will be sharing all of the content with Sean and all the contact details at the end. Um, and he'll send that out to you guys later. So thank you very much. And we'll be open for questions uh, now if anyone's got any. Yeah, thank you so much for the presentation, guys. Very appreciate you guys coming on and sharing your insights there. Um, yeah, to, to everyone involved, please feel free to chop your, chuck your questions in the chat or, or speak up and, and, and ask a few. I've definitely got myself um, quite a few questions to ask, but if anyone else wants to jump in before me, feel free. Um, oh, I might just jump in actually. Um, with the recruitment, do you guys take in applications from international students? Because that is actually a big uh, criteria for a lot of companies, I believe. Yeah. Sure, sure. I might vocalize a little bit on our, um, our current international hiring and uh, visa sponsorship policy uh, on this one. So, Henry, um, yes, in the, in the simple terms, we do accept applications from international mm -hmm. students. Um, we have an ability to sponsor a number of people within our Australian business unit aligned to percentages of our permanent residents. It's, it's a company ruling. The main consideration against this is to be able to build up the experience to make you um, applicable for sponsorship. You have to be able to support your first two years of working independently. At that point, we will review. And if you've been a good analyst and you've been successful throughout that two year, you will be in review for sponsorship from that point. We're unable to offer any support within that two year period. Yeah, okay, cool. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Um, I just had a quick question. Um, obviously, you guys are a global company with like lots of different spots all around the world. If you know, we were to get into your company. Um, is it something that we would be able to like work in the different areas around the world and like travel around to the different spots within the company, or is it like like quite separated Australia specifically? No, good good question, Stuart. Thank you. Um, I might throw it to Patrick on this one. Yeah, sure. yeah, absolutely. Uh, great question. And absolutely, not only is it something that we do, it's something that we very much encourage of course, outside of a global pandemic. Uh, Dan mentioned before that you know, he's moved out from the UK business unit. I started at Quick Release uh, on a working holiday that was supposed to last a year that lasted four, uh, and then came back and uh, you know, just to sort of start off the business unit here. We've had people come out from Germany. Um, we've had people come out in sabbaticals, long-term relocations, whenever we can to bring some of that uh, you know, experience and knowledge in uh, globally. We're sharing as much as we possibly can. So we really, really encourage that cross-pollination uh, between our different business units wherever possible. So absolutely, barring travel um, restrictions is something that we absolutely look to plan for as, as part of people's you know, uh, long-term plans and, and ways that we can sort of be as global as possible. At the moment, while we can't do that, uh, we're doing as much as we can to, to cross business unit support where of course time differences and those sorts of things allow. It's, it's one of those sort of advantages. It's not, not, a, not a complete advantage, but because we can't be on site, then our customers are more open to that offsite support and that global support. So it's something that we, you know, even while not being able to get face to face, we have a very strong focus on uh, staying connected, even if it's not uh, support related or, or, or business related, making sure we're staying connected from a relationship perspective is, is, is very, very high on our priority list. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, hopefully that answers what, what, we, what we aim to do uh, without restrictions. Yeah, it does. Thank you. I might just add to that, Pat, on the, one of the initiatives we had. We had so we have, a, we, have a, we have a Slack channel, like our homogenous brain of the company is basically Slack, like everything goes through there. And we have a, a, an automated coffee chats channel where it will pair you up randomly with somebody um, to have a specified meeting. So that's allowed us to just 
have chats with people from different units without really having to set an agenda for it, which I love. Sorry, just wanted to add that in. And DJ, okay. just let me decide to, to just to complete. Uh, we have some projects that's actually work um, that are actually ongoing with uh, different countries um, for some uh, project actually for 2022. We might uh, have some of our Australian team going to France to get trained for a few months and then be back uh, in Australia to, to, to deploy the activity locally. So there is also some uh, cross-functional uh, work between countries in uh, four years. Okay. Awesome. We had a question here in the chat from Jay uh, that says, I was wondering if QR has some intern roles on offer which can be converted into a graduate role in future when I graduate. It, that, that's a great question, Jay. Uh, thanks very much. So with this one, this is a structure and process that we do offer in our European offices, um, some of our more legacy structured sets. It's not currently something that we offer in Australia. Um, however, a little bit of inside look as part of my recruitment view, um, I am looking to establish that process for us. So not currently, Jay, apologies. Um, only offering permanent roles at the minute, but it's something we are looking at for the future. I had a question for Haydar. He mentioned earlier that change management isn't really taught at university that much. Um, and I was wondering if students wanted to get sort of a leg up and starting to learn a bit of change management, because it'd probably be pretty helpful with their final year capstone projects as well as in the workforce later on. How could they start that journey? Um, yeah, look, that's, that's a great question. And, and honestly, it's one of the things I've been wondering about since I've joined, um, joined QR and, and started to learn about how Ford works. Um, I, I don't actually know how you how you go and do that is is company proprietary software oh sorry not software processes and um, yeah it's, it's hard to translate that because it's a very bespoke system it it really depends on the company you are and how you operate um, what we're looking at at the moment and what we're discussing um, with one of the Melbourne Uni lecturers is actually starting to sprinkle change management into into the Melbourne Uni uh, the capstone process and and uh, all the engineering subjects that lead up to it, at least. Um, it, is, it is tough to, to start doing something like that within a student team and, um, and, and actually lay out a process, but it's, it's honestly just a logic path and, and it's a chain of questioning and, and, and it's a chain of approval that you just need to sit down and work it out as a team. You know, who does this change affect? Who should approve this? And, and that's how you start building that system. And, and um, you know, I've, I've had a lot of thoughts in my time about how we could have used it at MUR and how it could have been implemented. And, and I guess um, we, we could definitely start the conversation between uh, what we do as QR and, and what you guys do in teams. Um, mm. So my role as uni relations, I, I've started that conversation about sprinkling in the subject and we are considering setting up some kind of workshops in future where we have you guys as teams come in and, you know, talk about what you're doing and, any ideas you might have for change management and start really putting that together with you and putting together a framework and giving our advice of how it works to, to help you like develop something that works for you. Um, nothing at the moment, but you know, we've, we've just started doing this and hopefully the ball gets rolling and we put those in place soon enough. Amazing. That sounds like a, a fantastic future initiative. So it looks like we've got one more minute left. So um, I'll probably wrap it up here unless there's any burning questions that we've got from the audience quickly. But um, yeah, thank you so much for, for giving the talk and for coming in and bringing so many people to really, really help our students understand better what, what Quick Freeze does and, and the whole process of change management. Um, as Daniel said, this has been recorded. So we'll be sending this out to all of the rest of the student um, society from the mechanical engineering perspective. So we can spread this to spread the word and get more people understanding a bit of the change management perspective. And I'll also share those slides. So. Yeah, thank you so much um, for coming on out today. And yeah, we really appreciate everything. I'm sure we, we gained a lot from it. I learned a lot about change management personally. So um, I hope that the rest of the students were able to do the same. That's great. That's great. But not, to, not to go against any of that, but um, I am available. I don't have to jump before. So if there are any more questions, very happy to stay on. But if you need to close it, that's fine. Um, and just in, in review, thanks so much for the opportunity. Thank you all for your time uh, and your uh, concentration. Really appreciate that. Hello. Hello. Can you guys hear me? Hi, is that you, sir?
Yeah. Please. Uh, so um, I had a question about like the senior projects. Like you guys were talking about it, but I'm not sure like on a day-to-day -day basis, like what does that look like? Uh, sorry, so you're talking about the senior project? Well, not just, just any project in general, like, like if it was sure. if we would start working there, like what would we, what would we be doing on like a day to day? Yeah, yeah, uh, give me one second. I have a slide for this somewhere. Your day to day. So when we were looking at the under the bonnet aspect of the work that we do, um, there, there are many different things. So it really depends on the type of project that you're in. If you're doing program management, change control coordination, it's gonna look very different to you if you're working with me on electrical cost reduction ideas. Um, so quantifying the day-to-day the -day aspect like that is a little bit difficult. What I can show you is a sort of a general, what a PDM analyst's day looks like, which is... That's cool. How do I share my screen again? Here it is. <laughs> Can you see a man sitting as a clown at a desk? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this is typically what the day looks like. So this is actually one of our founders, Rob Rody. I think it was Cologne Carnival uh, Day or something. So he came in dressed. But typically the days, it's really mixed up. And like I said, it really depends on the type of project that you're working on. So, you know, good good quarter of data crunching goes into that. There's quite a lot of meetings you know, when you live and when you work in these complex, sorry, when you live, when you work in these complex environments, you got to talk to these teams. You know, you spend a lot of time doing that, um, chatting to people face to face, managing your projects and your priorities, you know, what aspects am I going to work on when, who needs what. Um, levels of problem solving, you would be surprised at the number of problems we come across each and every day that need us to go and create a solution for. <laughs> We do try and protect sort of like development time. You know, it's important for us that our analysts are getting better and they feel they can see their improvement through that. So we want to protect learning as part of this. That's sort of what a day looks like. Okay. So there isn't like a research and development aspect to the company? Yeah, no, interesting question. So in terms of research and development, so the key thing to make clear use of, I guess, is that between PDM and engineering services, we are an advisory service. So we support- Oh, okay, our, cool. Yeah, yeah, we support, we don't produce our products. Our products are our analysts and the work that we do internally. So the research and development is against, you know, the processes, how did we learn from the last project? How are we gonna improve the next project? That being said, there is a initiative going on in the UK at the moment, very early stages called QR&D, Computer Research and Development, where we're looking at doing maybe sponsored PhDs against system engineering, but not to make any promises, that's very early stages, but it is around the things that we're thinking about doing. Is there like particular companies that you're doing consulting for? Or like you're doing projects for, I guess? Yeah, sure, so a big, Part of our project work here in Australia is with Ford Automotive, based here in Melbourne. Um, we do have a couple other bits and pieces. As Vincent mentioned, uh, we're working in rolling stock as well as in Bombardia for the train um, production. We also have some naval projects in Adelaide. Um, but the majority of the work for PDM is with Ford here. Cool. Thanks for answering my question. No problem. Thank you. Sorry, John, I've sort of taken off your end time for you, mate. <laughs> oh, that's okay. I've also got time this afternoon, so I don't mind at all. Um, yeah, and if there's any more questions from any of the other students that are still on the call, feel free to feel free to ask away if you've still got time, Daniel. Happy to, happy to. I might take off this slide of the clown man though. Uh, wasn't here. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff actually, Tim. So like, I have a. I have like a three hour version of this presentation that I've delivered as a guest lecture. So there's lots of different stuff that we could be talking about in terms of complexity. I'm gonna just run this slide because it's pretty hilarious. Uh, boom, 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 boom. So in a Ford 1.5 liter, you can have 227 different combinations for it. In the transit, you can have over a hundred million different potential builds. This is the type of complexity. I was talking about the sandwiches. This is actually what we're looking at in terms of work. Uh, oh, just a bit of context there. Um, yeah, any questions, please? Oh, 
and see people sliding off so we will call it there <laughs> yeah it looks like looks like we're all done for the day but yeah thanks again guys for for everything that was that was really informative and like i said i'll be sharing everything with the, the rest of the the gang so hopefully um, we can spread the, the word wide and far okay, i'll send you some uh, contact names as well